Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 626. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Wayland, Dr. Norwich. I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the duke of you know, the sultan of strategery, the indestructible bridge defying, is very concerned that Sean's dream superhero origin story always involves him as a podcaster avenging the gruesome death of his kind and relatable co-host and the elder statesman of the <laughs> podcast, Segulin. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're talking about some Elseworld style stories in Batman One Dark Knight and Dark Knights of Steel, issue number three. We are sponsored as always by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? We got a lot of cool Batman stuff coming through the pipeline. Uh, we've got Batman Beyond, The White Knight, issue one of eight, 50% off, only $249. We've got Batman Black and White box set. Again, 50% off, $52.50. We've got Batman Fear State Saga hardcover, 50% off, $24.99. And we've got Batman Killing Time, one of six. Again, Tom King story, 50% off, only $249. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, if you're listening to the show, especially as it's evolved, I've become very, very into collected editions. They're pretty critical to me um, as far as my collecting habits now. They have some great deals of the week, and I urge you to keep checking these out. Wonder Woman, Book 2, Aries Rising Trade Paperback. This is a $30 trade paperback. 60% off, only eleven ninety nine. Young Justice Volume 3, Warriors and Warlords Trade Paperback. That's the current Wonder Comics, uh, the, the most recent Wonder Comics series. That is a $19.99 trade paperback that is 60% off only $7.99. You start adding up the savings, it's pretty crazy. Super Sons trade paperback, book one, Polar Shield Project. It's part of that new young adult series that they're doing. That's a $10 book, 65% off only $3.49. Omnibuses, you want omnibuses? Robin, the Bronze Age Omnibus hardcover, $125 book, 65% off, $43.75. So you think about that, if you're looking for any of these books, my gosh, with the savings, you start buying, you buy that omnibus, you can get the other books for free. <laughs> I mean, when you really think about the cover price of these things. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show, but also providing these great deals because it's pretty critical for somebody like me now who I'm buying a lot of books digitally. I'm ju buying just as much in paper as I was before, but my collecting needs have changed. And in that process, being able to save is allowing me to take that same dollar amount that I was spending before gets a lot more mileage. So thank you, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Green Lantern, let you and I destroy that space junk. Our first discussion this episode is going to be of Batman One Dark Knight Book One. Story and art by Jock. Letters by Clem Robbins. Cover by Jock. Variant cover by Cliff Chang. Blackout variant cover by Lee Garbutt. Batman created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger. The editor is Chris Conroy. Marquise Draper is the assistant editor. Darren Robinson's on production design and Tiffany Huang publication production. And I wanted to shout out publication design in general just because, boy, these black label books, I, I just love every one of them that comes out. And I don't say that lightly. I think this is a brand that I've become very protective of. Because it, it, there, I grew up with the prestige format. And when those came out, you expected a certain level of quality from them. Not that I wasn't enjoying my monthly books. I was, and I was getting quality from them. But this was something different. It was usually on better paper. Because that was during a time where paper quality was varied across comics. And you would get this like higher quality paper, higher, qual higher quality cover stock. You knew it was something special. Whether it was it was a hard cover, harder harder covered soft cover book, or an actual hardcover production, you knew these things meant something. They were something more. They're doing this with black label. 
they're releasing it in a variety of different formats where it's these you know extra expanded prestige format they're doing hardcover or they're doing monthly books that are like these limited series but they're always top quality creative teams who are telling unique stories this one knowing it was going to be jock i'm a big fan of jock's art having jock craft the entire story and the artwork wow this really really first issue out delivered a lot of what i love about batman we'll delve into that as we're going forward what is this like for are you, are you a fan of jocks i mean this is jock one of your artists that's like you're really a fan of because i know that's always subjective like who are some of your favorites jock's one of my favorites where are you at on jock and, and this book in particular Okay, well, first off, uh, Jock, I like him. I do like his work. Um, he's a name I know and a name I recognize. And if I see his name on a title, I will give it a second uh, look at whether I want to pick it up or not. Like, for example, if I saw Jock was working on some book non-DC, I would take a second look at it and I would read the uh, yeah, I would read the stuff on it and say, okay, is this something I'm going to be interested in? There are certain creators that if I see their name on it, I don't even bother to read the summary of it, I just click on buy, just because I know anything they touch is, is something I absolutely love. He's a guy who his name draws my attention, and I will give it a second read through and see, is this something I want to pick up? Now, with this title, even if we weren't doing a, um, even if we weren't doing a DC podcast, his name on a bat book would have 100% been my click on without even reading it. Yeah. You know, because his style and his his storytelling style, I think really, and I was like, man, that's going to be a good story because I like his, his, his storytelling. I like his art style. And I always thought that would be a really good fit for the bat title. So going into this book, I already had an anticipation that, you know, this is going to be something I'm going to enjoy. You know, and this is something I'm like, I think this is something I'm going to dig. And, and it was funny, I didn't even read the premise behind this, you know, when it, yeah, when it was announced, I was thinking one dark night as in like the dark night returns or that kind of thing. I wasn't actually thinking a dark night. I wasn't even thinking a blackout kind of scenario. So yeah. when I'm reading it, it's like, oh, that's kind of neat how they played that off, how they did that. And I read the, the uh, you know, the, the commentary or the uh, synopsis of it before buying it, I would have seen something like that. But, you know, so that was kind of a neat thing going on. Yeah, you know, with with him and his work and his you know connection, you know this this his storytelling style and his art style, and it's it, I love when it's a writer artist together because the storytelling style isn't just the story being told, it isn't just the art. It is that combination. It is that amalgamation, and it's. You know, we always talk about how when an art and when a write when the writing and the art team really works together, you get this great book. Well, you got the same guy doing that, so that really is going to escalate things and really make things kind of neat. So I'm, I was, I was anticipating this before reading it, and now that I read issue one, I'm like, yes, one's issue two. Give me more, please. It, so with artists, do you are there artists that you follow that no matter what they do where they do it you're going to grab their work because they're a favorite artist yes okay because that's that's for me jock jock is one of those artists for me it's interesting um, and, and i think that's different for every person as far as who they are but that's one of the things with comics there are certain people if, if i find out that an artist like sight unseen and you mentioned it here actually because you and i were both in the same boat on this one I knew that Jock was doing Batman One Dark Knight. I didn't bother reading the blurb. I don't, oh, <laughs> Jock, I'm in. Got it. So I didn't know any of the premise of this story. And that's sometimes a lot of fun just to go into this not knowing, like, okay, what's this thing going to be about? I turned page one and just started reading <laughs> and, yep. and kind of went through. And it was really refreshing to do that without knowing any of the premise of it just because, I, as Jock, okay, let's go with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's it's funny because, you know, with our team and me, I'm more if I see the writer is usually more of a blind purchase than the art team. Usually an art team. If I see an artist, I'm going to usually like read the synapses and say, OK, is this something that uh, is going to be kind of cool? There are some artists that I jump on just because I know I trust that their judgment that they're not going to pick up some uh, a bad story. So I'm like, you know what? They're a really good artist. I, you know, I, I, everything I, they've been attached to, they don't just go. Ah, I think I, I need them. I need a paycheck and just grab something. So there are some artists out there, but as a general rule for me, it's more of the writers that I blindly follow. 
you know, whereas our team, certain artists will get me to read, will get me to stop, read a synopsis and say, yes, I'm going to pick that up. And if I'm, and it's one of those weird things where if I'm mildly interested in it, but it has an artist that I really enjoy, I'll grab it. Whereas if a story is I'm mildly interested, I don't see any anybody that has my attention, I won't even get I usually won't even give it a try because there's so much out there for me to read now. You know, both in DC and out of DC, there's so much out there that I'm like, oh let me give that a try. Oh, that story looks pretty good. I have no idea who those people are, but that story sounds kind of cool. I'll grab it. You know, and it's but you know, as I said, he's one of those guys that I see his name. You know, I jump on it. If I, again, if I see his name as artist and writer, I 100% will immediately jump on it because I do like his storytelling style. You know, and that's, you know, that he, again, he's, he's a kind of a, it's the cool thing about the story was, yeah, this is a black light. So it's not in the DC continuity air quotes around that, but it very easily could be placed in there. And I love those kind of stories. I love the black label, but I especially love when they tell a story that could be in that universe. It's not something so far out fetched. Now I like, you know, when creative teams, you know, take some licensing, they try something different. Hey, what about the, the what if kind of thing? The else world stories. I like those. I really enjoy those, but I really do like these kind of black label stories that could very easily be plopped into the DC continuity because the characters read so real and true to what I'm used to. Are all black label books out of continuity? I guess I, I never thought of it. And I'm not, this isn't me questioning you. I'm genuinely asking the question because I guess I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about it because I think some of these ones that skirt the line more, I'm like, I don't know if they were given a black label because of the quality because to me, I, black label is a symbol of quality, a symbol of a certain creators um, and certain teams that they put together telling certain kinds of story. Uh, I guess I never made the assumption. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm, I'm curious about this now. This story could be in continuity. You know, I, I, and I think yeah. you're making an interesting point there. I guess I don't know does... Because of a black label slap onto that, does that mean that that story is not in continuity for sure? Or uh, is it a statement of quality? And I, I don't, I guess I don't know the answer to that. I think this is just a good Batman story, you know, done by Jock that has the black label because of the quality of the story and the artwork. Uh, and I, I guess, like any Batman miniseries, we're kind of left with we could plug this in somewhere if we choose to. Right. And I, I always just assumed black label meant non-continuity. You know, that was my opinion on it. But again, it very easily, I I don't know. It, it, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, my personally, every time I read these black label stuff, I took it that they didn't occur in the actual DC continuity. And it was just a kind of a, another Elseworld story. I guess I don't, I don't know that. It's maybe not that way. I don't know. I guess, well, it depends. And to be honest, I don't. And it doesn't bother me either way, knowing or not knowing. Because, yeah. again, I, every time I've read Black Label, I've enjoyed it. I'm like, this is a really cool story. So it's something like, I'm like, yeah, okay, give me more. Give me good reading. If it doesn't, if it is part of it, awesome. If it's not, awesome. I enjoyed what I read. You know, I'm going to read it multiple times. I'll go back later on and probably reread this once this is done. I could see me picking up a uh, collected edition on this thing. I can see me right now out of after issue one. I'm thinking if they do an absolute on this, I'm jumping on that. Yeah. Because, again, this is something that I would love to have that large oversized tome. Just sit down one day, you know, just, you know, flip through it and enjoy it. Yeah, it's uh, the Jock. Anytime Jock's on the artwork, I, I would love an absolute, and and that's what absolutes are for me. It's um, it, it's a great story, but it, there's there's got to be a level of artwork quality that yeah. lends to an absolute. Uh, that to me, that that's what makes those volumes special. It's when you're turning those pages and you've got the oversized artwork. It's got to be a. I mean, I love killer stories too. Don't don't get me wrong on that. It's the marriage of both that's got to go together. You mentioned an interesting thing before about. Um, Following writers, following artists. I, I remember very young, um, and I'm going back to the 80s, where I started realizing who writers were. Like, Chris Claremont was the one. If you ask me who's the first writer you remember following, definitely Chris Claremont. It wasn't that there weren't writers that I was enjoying before that. I just hit an age where I started paying attention more to the credits. I was reading Uncanny X-Men, 
and getting heavily, you know, it was a single book. And this is before the Wolverine miniseries or any of that stuff. I was getting really into Chris Claremont's writing and character development. So I was following him. But also at that time, John Byrne was on that book and became very well aware of John Byrne's art. Before John Byrne, though, John Buscema, and I'm, if I'm butchering his last name, apologies, that was back in there where you didn't hear the names. But um, he was another artist. He had done uh, he'd done a book, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. I liked his artwork that much that I knew I had zero art talent, but I was I grabbed that book, and I was following that thing. I was trying. Yeah. <laughs> but what was fun about it was just seeing his artwork and in, in, in the sense, you know, it's kind of the sensibilities of the artwork. Uh, and that was, that was a book that I really enjoyed. I got it from the library at that time. Uh, but that was another, John Buscema actually before John Byrne was an artist who I just started to become aware of. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of them. Like I'd already read George Perez's initial Justice League issues that we've done on this show as an anniversary episode. But I wasn't aware of George Perez then. I, I hadn't yeah. like hit that point where I was old enough that I was paying attention, or you know, mature, you know, <laughs> not as much age as much as uh, I became much more of a connoisseur, shall we say, of comics. <laughs> where you start to become aware, you start going back then and start looking at names and starting to become aware of them. Uh, but that that. There's an interesting balance for me of writers and artists that I follow that I'm so glad to this day I've retained uh, because I think it's just, it's an important part of comics and getting to know what you like. uh, Because that's why I was asking the question the way I did with Jock. It wasn't to set you up or, you know, to, with one of those things, it was more, I really am into Jock. I've always been very, you know, since I became very well aware of his artwork, it's somebody who just really speaks to me. To your point, particularly on stories like this, where they're, you know, the Batman-driven stories, Jock does a great job. But Jock, I will follow Jock's artwork elsewhere because I really enjoy that art. And I think that's different from to different people. Everyone has those artists that speak to them. And you tend to follow those artists to a wide variety of different projects. And Jock is one of those for me. This story was really, really interesting because we're seeing a Gotham City that's going through a lot of trouble. I mean, just day-to-day environmental trouble with this like heat wave that they're going through right now. Overwhelming heat. Um, they're trying to keep up with it. The, the city that doesn't need any help to be like shaken up. <laughs> it's like they've got this environmental crisis going on right now. And in the middle of it, they're going through some internal turmoil with their police departments where once again, they're restructuring, reorganizing how they handle criminals and not everyone's on the same page. We've got Gordon on one page. We've got another person on another page as far as how to handle these criminals feeling like Gordon's too lenient. It's very, not just too lenient with the criminals. There is undertones that he's also too lenient with Batman. It's an interesting sort of story where we get that. I really, really dig the fact that we've got so much Jim Gordon in this, so much Batman in this, uh, elements of Bruce Wayne in this, and Alfred. Alfred, Alfred, Alfred is so, so good in this. I love Alfred. And I think because of the fact that we don't have him in the main continuity, to be able to see him here, oh, actually both books that we're going to be talking about this episode, we get some really great Alfred. This is, to me... It's where before when you were saying, is this, out of, and that wasn't me disputing you. I think you're right. I think Black Label's kind of like, you know, its own little bubble. But this very much is a story that I could in my head plug into continuity at a certain point in time because it doesn't have to fly in the face of continuity. I think it's up to us as fans. Eh, is this a thing that's in or not? doesn't matter. It's a great Batman story, a great Alfred story. Alfred's terrific in this. I know Penny One is awesome, and I I, keep, I always call him by the code name because I kind of like that, and I don't like the Beagle code name because that was when he was a spy. When he's Alfred, when he is the the, the right hand of, of the Bat, you know, to me it's always Penny One. I like that, and I, I, I always you know they don't use the code names in this uh, series, and again I'm like I'm cool with it non code names, but there's always something when it gives him a, a, an additional acknowledgement of that he isn't just the butler; he is more than. And, and in this story, as well as in the next one we're going to be talking about, he's not just the, the butler. There is something more to him. And he and Bruce's relationship are awesome. 
I love when he's in the book. It's why I'm digging how they told the story and I'm digging how his, him not being around has affected so many people. But I am so, so hungry for his return. The return of Alfred for me is going to be huge in continuity. And that's something I really hope they someday, they do sooner than later because yeah, we're getting some great stuff, but just the, the moment that it's like this book right here really shows what a really cool Alfred can do. Like there's a lot of, we talk about how Gotham is, has to be a character yeah. and a really good bat story. Gotham's a character here. Jim Gordon has to be a solid piece of that, you know, bat story. Jim Gordon's a solid piece. Alfred has to be a solid piece. Alfred's a solid piece. So right from jump, we're getting all of the, what I call must haves in a good bat story. We're getting that right now. So that's kind of, I'm, so it's funny because right from jump, I'm like, this is good. I'm, I'm already enjoying this. I'm looking forward to it. The mentioning of the heat wave, because I'll tell you, Heat wave drives these big cities crazy. Sure. One of the reasons I'm kind of glad I live out here, you know, in the you know in the the suburbs of uh, Cleveland, I don't deal with the extreme heat. I don't deal with the extreme cold the way that the actual city, you know, an inner city does. You know, and a city like Gotham, you know, one hundred percent they respond to the extreme weather. I'm sure anybody who lives, you know, in New York City, you know, Chicago, any of the really big big cities where people are. Just just stacked on top of each other. When you get this kind of weather, it really does agitate things. You know, think about just how miserable you are when you're hot. Imagine on top of it, you've got millions of people all in that same thing. It just creates a powder keg that life explodes. And I was like, man, I really dig the fact that they brought that, that became a factor into the story. I love that I've got this image of you now living in this sub suburban home with a dome over your house with a big yard sign that says weather don't bother me. <laughs> so you're pretty, I'm glad I live in a suburb where weather doesn't affect me. <laughs> well, it, it, I know I'm kidding. Really, I'm just, teasing. You know, I'm get teasing. Get cold, I'm but, teasing. You know, I've got a nice distance around me. My neighbor, I'm not stacked, and it's you know, mm-hmm. you know, for me, like you know, we're right. right now Cleveland's getting ready to do, get another. Uh, a cold front is sweeping in, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, it's 40s outside and it's going to be 20s by this afternoon. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that stinks. It's cold. But Dad and I are fine. You know, we've got plenty of groceries. We just we did grocery shopping yesterday. We've got gas for the snowblower. I'm all ready for it. I'm not too worried about it. And just like summertime, I you know I've got my, as long as my AC is running, I'm fine. AC goes out, uh, there's going to be there's going to be a little bit of issues. But you know where the heat goes out, I'm in trouble. But for as long as I got power, I'm good to go. Right, right, yeah. Which is different than when you're dealing with people who are living in um, apartment buildings, things like that, where you know if the AC goes out in an apartment building, you're pretty much so doomed. <laughs> Yeah, it's, and I've been there before. Where my wife and I, our first place was an apartment, and we had the AC go out. We had the heat go out one year too, and uh, it makes it makes for a not very fun experience. So in this situation, we've got this villain EMP, who um, I didn't. I'm like, who is that? I don't know who the character is or anything like that. It may have been a previously used Batman villain, but I certainly it wasn't one that came to the top of my mind there's been so many batman villains over the years that have had like clever names like that that yeah. have been like bit pieces that have come in that like if i go back oh that's who that was i'm sure there's probably if if this was a character used elsewhere i know the story but you get the idea from the name automatically what his power set's going to be yeah <laughs> and you, what we don't know they're worried about him we don't know yet what level of danger or threat that he is. But we know it's big because they're concerned enough that this transport of this character is a big deal. If something goes wrong here, they're very worried about it. What you didn't realize early on is there's this like this group of young, you know, twenty to thirty somethings or something like that that have got guns that I thought they were they were planning on ripping off, you know, various businesses and things like that. Didn't realize this was a group that it's like getting ready to take out that convoy and to kill EMP and perhaps Batman in the process. 
And it's it's funny. I loved the gradual build of what are they doing? What are they yeah. at? What is their actual goal and motivation? You don't know it early on. I know I'm jumping to it real quickly, but I think it's important to reference it now because when I read it through again, it was interesting reading how well crafted that was. Because early on, you don't know that. Halfway through, you still don't fully know what they're doing. And you know that they're they're going after EMP as the story progresses, you know, pretty quickly, but you don't know why. Why are they doing it? What are they trying to do? Are they trying to, you know, are, are they part of his gang? Are they trying to do it? No, there's some kind of, they want revenge of some sort, or they, they want to take him out for some reason. I loved the use of maps in this story because it gave you a sense of scale to Gotham. It gave you a sense of where everything's located and how somebody would plan some heist like this. It also gave you a sense of just how many crime families and gangs are in Gotham and operating that can be an influence to this particular story. This gave you, very quickly in book one, a sense of intimacy to Gotham and a sense of danger to Gotham and how this story is going to really... I mean... Book one does a lot. I can't wait for book two because it's like they ripped the Band-Aid off in book one. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, and to your point, when they first started showing all the different gang activities, you know, you're, you're left with the, okay, are they just going to start doing, you know, their own just little, is this going to be the petty crime that's spiking that everyone's thinking, you know, the yep. city's going to start tearing itself apart because of the heat? Or... Because I was initially thinking they're going to break out EMP, that these are all part of his crew mm-hmm. who was going to get him out, who was going to break him out and rescue him. That's how I was looking at this thing, not as an assassination attempt. So for me, that was a really cool swerve in my head because I'm thinking on my on my in my mind, okay, this is you know his crew coming to save him. And then I realized, no, they're not out to save him; they're out to kill him. I'm like, oh, that's nice, and then adds to it. It's not just one crew out to kill him. It's all of these different crews. So then my head starts spinning on to issue two where we're going to have Batman having to deal, having to keep this guy alive and deal with all these other gangs. And to your point, that map was beautiful. Just letting you know exactly how far he's going to have to carry this guy. No powers, no equipment, no vehicles, none of the bat stuff. It's just Batman sheer uh, will, you know, taking him across the uh, across this massive city, you know, and fighting off all these different gangs and dealing with a city that's tearing itself apart. You know, just again, another standard day for Batman. (laughs) But I'll tell you, man, this was awesome. Yeah. And also the distance from Arkham Asylum to Blackgate Island, you know, just I mean, you're covering like there's no way to avoid any of the things that we see later in the second map. The first map's pretty critical to give you kind of like this sense of distance. The second, and and where Batman's already traveled at this point. Because they give you like the destination route and you're then you see later like the gang activity along the way. It's yeah. like, oh no. And Batman's going to be on foot for this? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Carrying EMP? Um, wow. This is really cool. Um, it's it's something that was scale is something that's critical because we've talked on episodes before about the fact that Nightwing has his own book in a in an area of Gotham that isn't even shown on this map. Catwoman has her own book, area of Gotham, not shown on this map. So Gotham's huge. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that actually it's it is you know again one of the things that. It really does show is just the scope and magnitude yeah. of this city. You know, like you know, where I'm at, I could drive from one end of the city to the other in 15 minutes, not mm-hmm. an issue. You know, maybe 16 if I get stopped at the stoplights. You know, but that's about it. Whereas Gotham, going from one spot to the other, that's an hour in transit. Right. That's an hour if the transit didn't get blown up. You know, just regularly driving the route that they had laid out, that would have been one hour. And I thought that, for me, was a really cool statement of how long it, it is. So, again, it adds to the whole you know, extra stuff where we got EMP, where if the sun comes up, he's going to get all that solar energy, and he can go boom again, and who knows what kind of boom that'll be. So, it, it, again, it's, he's got this clock, you know, this, this you know, clock ticking that he's got to get him back. He's got to get him to Blackgate. 
before sunrise. And I thought that was a kind of, again, added to the old dun da da kind of excitement, you know, that there is just this constant clock running. He's got, you know, I'm, again, I'm so looking forward to the second issue where it's just going to be the scramble bat. And those are some can be some really cool stories where you see Batman scrambling, improvise, adapt, overcome. How does he get past this? It's I'm 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 very excited for this. So the Vasque, Vasquez, if I'm pronouncing your last name right, and Montoya, those sequences. It's this is a great use of Montoya. Montoya acts as kind of the peacekeeper, uh, genuinely understanding what this new prison bureau is trying to do while at the same time understanding Gordon's reluctance because Gordon's been through this all and he's Gordon's trying to reach out and trying to understand but there's some serious philosophy differences between the two of them that come about in this story I love Gotham Central was one of my favorite series and I, I think a lot of the Gotham TV show spun out of what was great about Gotham Central. I'd love to see something like that revitalized again because I think it's such an interesting exploration when you take a look at this because you're getting that in here. I love when they do this kind of exploration of uh, politics and the behind the scenes of what goes on in Gotham City because it fleshes out the idea of this world that, of course, Gotham would be a bed of this. Because of its size, there's a lot of money in Gotham. And it's something that we kind of take for granted as readers when we talk about it, you know, billionaires and things like that running around Gotham. Uh, Because even Bruce now, in regular continuity, where he has less money, is still a millionaire. (laughs) You know, so I mean, we're dealing with a city that has a lot of money invested in it. And there's, anytime there's that kind of money, there is a need to have an infrastructure. And the infrastructure costs can never quite, you know, the dollars spent on infrastructure, I should say, can never quite meet the need. Uh, And you see that in Gotham, but boy, do they have a lot of things going on. And this Prison Bureau whole exploration thing, I thought it was really an interesting tack to take in this and, and, and to follow through because, of course, this would be something, we've seen it happen before, but of course it would be something when you've got these metahumans, these superpower humans who keep getting out of Arkham Asylum, well, maybe what you're doing in Arkham Asylum isn't so great. Let's try a different approach. And what happens when that approach blows up in your face? Because it's like, you don't understand. It's not that we aren't trying here. Look at what we're dealing with in Gotham. And that comes to a head in this. And I really, really enjoyed that. And it wasn't like one of those where I wanted Gordon like running around or going, nah, 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 I told you, or anything like that, even though he does a, he does a little bit of that. <laughs> um, it's, it's an interesting sort of conundrum because it's not that Gordon isn't trying. It's not that he's so stuck in his ways. You're dealing with such an intense level of power. Look at EMP and what he can do. It was that part added a lot of depth to EMP, who, if you didn't have that going on behind the scenes, would have been another super bad who happens to have powers. That stuff going on behind the scenes added a lot more drama, a lot more build, a lot more reality to when it, when it actually happens. The event that we see towards the end of this story and the lights go out and you realize what that means. It wasn't just like in a small area. The lights went out in the entirety of that map that we saw. <laughs> and there are people looking to converge on Batman and EMP. This just added a sense of scale to it that I just thought was staggering. I really, really enjoyed that. Oh, God, yeah. And I think it's political intrigue. Just, yep. again, said before, I'll say again, Gotham itself has to be a character. And they did a beautiful job with that making just how life in Gotham is different than any other city. You know, I, I, we, I joke around a lot how I'd never want to live in Gotham and I, I still believe that, but Gotham life is something that really would fascinate me. Mm-hmm. You know, if I was, you know, if I lived in the comic book universe, I would know every single thing about Gotham city. I would be studying on it, reading it. I never would visit it because again, I, it terrifies me, but 
just the the fascination I have just in the comic book universe of it. You know, if I was actually living in this, you know, if I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, in you know, in the comic book in the DC universe, I would know everything there is to know about Gotham City just because it it is so interesting and fascinating. And again, the the with the um, statements on how you handle criminals, how you handle, you know, do we handle them as the insane? Do we handle them as the killing monsters they are? How do we deal with that? That is another really cool debate and really interesting, you know, just way of looking at life. You know, earlier Montoya is like, hey, you know, he sees you as a little bit radical, well, radical in change. You know, sometimes you need to be a little bit radical to, you know, to account for a positive change. And it is a, an interesting statement. What is, how do you deal with these people? How do you deal with this criminal element? Because there is a revolving door a lot of times. And it's in the real world, there's a lot of revolving doors, you know, on different criminals. And certain ones, they're like, no, we're locking them up, but we're never letting them out. Others, they're like, well, you know, you know, it, it, it's just like the system, you know, we're getting overcrowded, so we have to release the less violent ones and this and that. And there is there is this constant debate going on how we handle our prisoners, how we handle the people who broke the law. You know, and it's, you know, I, I tell you, there's so much out there right now about, you know, what is our prisons meant to be reform? Our prisons meant to be just keep them away from society. You know, do we just lock them up so they don't go after anybody else? Or do we actually want to help them change them so when it's time for them to leave, they can actually be a positive influence in society? And it's I love seeing those kind of like what are we doing with these people notions inside the comic book universe? Now, Brody, let's talk about him a little bit if we could. 846, this kid is sitting at his window watching Batman versus EMP and then in the chase, they end up crossing right in front of his window, which has got to be like, it's got to be scary and cool at the, like really cool at the yeah. same time where like this just happened. But did something happen to Brody? Did you notice, you know, with the colors, the red around his eyes? Like, was that a, Am I, am I? It was that a reflection of what was going on outside the window, you know, with EMPs li- being lit up the way he was, or was something happening to Brody there? Because part of me was like looking at that, like that could potentially be a reflection of what he's seeing outside. Another thing is something could be happening to Brody, and I, I could be reading too much into that. So I'm, I'm admitting I might be reading too much into it, but I just had the question, seeing as I saw that. See, I was thinking the exact same thing. I was thinking something happened to Brody, mm-hmm. you know, and those the the right around the eyes is the indicator to me that something else is going on with this kid. Yeah, you know, I, I you know, but again, it could very easy, as you said, that very easily could be reflection. But mm-hmm. I'm thinking it's not. I'm thinking there's something going on with Brody. Yeah, I was thinking that too. So I mean, that's, I, that's how I. That's it, it was funny because I, I read it the exact same way when I initially saw. It, I'm like, oh, that's cool. That kid's gonna be some meta thing, maybe. You know. And then I'm like, then I went back and then during the art read through, I was like, I don't know. Is that reflection? Because later on, when you see him, his eyes still aren't glowing. Right. So I'm like, could it just be that when EMP was there, it flared something in him? Could it be, as you said, reflection? Maybe I, I don't know. Or could it just be the fact that he was so focused on that? Oh my god! And that's kind of the way they show him focusing on it. I, I don't know. It, but my gut is telling me something happened to that kid. That kid has been triggered. You know, maybe he's got latent powers or something like that. He's going to be the next EMP. I don't know. There, this, this, I don't think this was a throwaway. I don't think this kid was put in there just uh, for that. I think he, we're going to see him later on. I think we're going to see the kid later on no matter what. Because I think the kid is like our, our boots on the ground. Like, either way, I think that's the way to see how this is affecting a traditional Gothamite, right? Yeah. So I think there's that's no matter what happens, that's going to be a piece um, it's it's really really interesting. As the chase goes on and EMP, you know, is is absorbing more power from a power line, things like that. You know, it's sometimes just circumstantially ends up landing somewhere. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of like some of this stuff. EMP wasn't exactly planning any of this. He's trying to get away from Batman, but I love that he needed one more thing. You know, like where there was one more thing that would cause him to pop. And I don't get the idea that EMP is a bad guy per se. Or, at, you know, at least, I, it looks like EMP is running, trying to get away, trying not to be killed, things like that. But I get this idea that he's not like a maniacal, like, you know, twisting Conquer his... the world villain. 
Yeah, I, I really don't, at least, and I, I could be wrong on this, but I'm getting that idea that this isn't, he's, it's more of a force of nature than this evil, conniving criminal. So he goes falling, and where does he fall to get that one more pop? Accidentally, he falls into the bat signal, <laughs> and it takes out the whole city. The whole city with that big boom. And I I love that, I, I mean, you saw that coming with the way that they were, like, starting to lead to that. But sometimes there's something to be said about just sometimes paying off something that you see happening. And that moment was really well crafted. Uh, it was it was totally handed to us in the way that I think it should be in that scenario. But it was really, really good. Yeah, see, I'm, I read him not as... I don't know. He was one of those because I wanted to know what previously happened because they they talk about the last time he got out, all the damage he did. And then Gordon and Vasquez had that conversation about the car about, hey, I know this is personal for you. It's like, hey, this isn't about family business. This is about catching the bad guy. So I'm thinking the last time he got out, her family was injured. Yep. You know, and and or killed. And I think he may be one of those characters that can't control it. So he may have had another one of these spontaneous explosions like this. And maybe it didn't just EMP blast the thing. Maybe it blew up something or killed somebody. I'm not sure. I'm kind of like those are the kind of stories that are running, running through my head right now. But again, it's one of those neat things where, you know, this character could be what was going on with him when he was locked in Arkham. Because he was desperate not to go back to Arkham. And sometimes you think about it, these prison cells you know, may be more torturous than we realize. Like if he was in like a cell that was siphoning off power, you know, maybe it wasn't gently siphoning off power. Maybe it was like, uh, you know, 24-7 torture on him as it's taking away the energy. Because they even talk in Blackgate how the, the cell is going – is going to be charged and powered up and his own personal energy is going, is needed to keep the cycle going on his containment cell at Blackgate. So that can't be too comfortable. You know, you think about it, if you're drawing energy from him, you know, and if they're not just calmly drawing, if they're forcibly pulling it from him, that may be adding to why he's so desperate to get away. We don't realize how much he was being tortured before. What you know? What the doctors and police and Bat thought maybe was a a safe and humane way of keeping him in reality could have been torture. And I think that's something that I'm wondering if we're going to find that out later on. You know, if that we're going to see, you know, start seeing the other side of you know, see the story from his side. Maybe he is a person who 100 percent didn't want to hurt anybody. Didn't he just explode? He just couldn't control it. And then he makes a mistake that's not his fault. He's then tortured for how many, for however long. So there's so many different ways this story can go with this guy. And again, it's one of those things where if I'm already thinking off page, I'm already thinking for issue two, that tells you how well this story was crafted in the first issue that it's got me thinking, well, what about this? What about that? Oh, they could go this route. You know, there's so many different things that this story could do that I'm really looking forward to it. Think about when you get overwhelmed, right? Uh, And we all get there. Life sometimes overwhelms us. We get overwhelmed by normal day-to-day things at times where there's things that are out of our control, right? Well, we, you and I, I mean, we've known each other long enough to know that at various times in our life, we've both been hit with things where you're hit from every angle, right? It's not just work. It's There's stuff going on with your family. There's stuff going on with friends. There's stuff going on personally, relationships, things like that. You know, you can get hit from just a variety of different avenues. Nothing seems to be working out and nothing you do seems to be helping that situation. Add into that this kind of level of power. And I think that's what his gig is. And it's, so it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes because... There's a morality to that to go, okay, he's a threat, a real threat. But at what point in time do you go, do you, is there intention? You know, intention is a driving force. Is he intending to do this or is he a victim? And I don't know enough of his backstory. They're questions that I have. So I think you're right. I think we're going to get some of this fleshed out as the story continues on. And I want to know more of his backstory because I'm making a lot of assumptions now. And there's things I threw out here that are assumptions. But it's because I like the character and the story enough 
that it's interesting. And I think seeing these other characters and how they've been affected by this guy and how this city's currently being affected by this guy and how many people are converging on this guy. There's something going on here that is really, really intriguing that I I can't wait to read more of. This was a surprise because I, like you, I walked in. It was a jock story. So I'm like, okay, great. Let me go read this really cool jock story. That's all it took for me. So I loved walking into this and not knowing that this was going to be this kind of story. You're right, the One Dark Knight title. Well, there's a reason for that title. (laughs) And I loved that the title has like a a play play on words, a play in the story. And it's, it's a great one. Issue two is coming out in February. I can't wait. Dude, I just noticed something right now as we're talking. What? Um, okay, so two pages before the big foom, and you know, one page right before he lands on the bat signal, and mm-hmm. you know, right as the bad guys are shooting the second missile at him, things are exploding. You've got Alfred breaking up, saying massive building damage. EMP is yelling, is saying the word Brody. Oh yeah 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 yeah. I didn't see that I either. Just, I just noticed that now. Yeah. I'm like, oh wow, cool. <laughs> What's going on with Brody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's definitely not a throwaway. It's definitely not a throwaway. That's neat. And again, I, and it's funny. I've read this thing like four times before this, and I just noticed that now. Yeah, that's cool. Jim, you want to talk some Dark Knights of Steel? Oh, definitely. Nice work, Adam. What are these characters up to? Our next discussion is on The Dark Knights of Steel, The Gathering Store, written by Tom Taylor, art by Yasmin Pup. P-U-T-R-I. I think Q-Tree, but I'm not sure. Uh, colored by Arif Peranti, Peran, P-R-I-A-N-T-O, with letters by Wes Abbott, cover by Yasmin Q-Tree, uh, variant cover by Joshua Middleton, and Yasmin uh, Q-Tree, um, edited by Ben Abernathy, and of course Superman was created by Cleveland's own Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. And again, apologies to especially the art team because I really butchered those names and this is a beautiful book. Well, it's funny you talk about a beautiful book. Like this is actually it's funny both titles this particular episode have something in common in the fact that there were creators that drew me to them so I didn't really Read a whole lot of the behind the scenes. <laughs> like Dark Knights of Steel, okay, you get kind of an idea from the title and, and from some of the preview artwork what the premise of this was going to be. But I didn't really know. You know, I didn't know, like, how did we get here and what, what led to all of this. It's Tom Taylor. You know, Tom Taylor was writing this. I'm like, okay, I'm in. Uh, I didn't really, at the time, I saw some preview artwork but didn't really pay attention too much to the art team until I was actually reading the first three issues Oh my gosh, is this the perfect art team for this book? What a beautiful, beautiful fantasy-driven book and the premise behind it. Here's one thing I'm finding that is pretty common in stories. If Jorel and Lara live, it never seems to be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, every time, every time there's been a super story where they've been around, things never... Clark isn't Clark. He, mm-hmm. he is he is Kal El. He's not Clark Kent, that Kansas farm boy who is the big blue boy scout. You know, and again, it, I think I love how the fact that not having Ma and Pa Kent around really does affect him. Really does change. You, you see how much of that personality came from the Kent family, and it's it's kind of I'm so glad that we got that. In this story, now I love the big blue boy scout. I love when Clark is Clark. You know, it's part of the part of the charm that I love Superman. But you get stories like this, and you get creative team who says, you know what? He doesn't have Ma and Pa Kent around. He's got his own thing, and I like seeing that. And I like seeing how you know Clark can be a, a bit of a jerk sometimes, but even not even a complete. I wouldn't call him a jerk no. throughout this. He's just had that regal royal upbringing. That is a little bit different. He's not as grounded. Part of the things that made Superman Superman was how grounded he is with the everyday person. Yes, he's got these godlike powers, but he is still that Kansas farm boy. You know, this universe, he's not. He's the prince. He's the prince of the House of El. You know, it's not just the, the kingdom of El. He's not just um, 
the simple farmer. And I think that for me is something that's kind of really cool that we're getting that right from jump and we're getting that right from the initial story and we're seeing those little variations. And again, you know, we both love Elseworld. We both love these alternate stories. So I've been, you know, Tom Taylor, you know, alternate story. I was hundred percent in on this one. Cause again, he's one of those names on the list that, you know, I see his name on a book. I grab it. You know, I don't need to read what it's about. Just from the, the initial cover arts, I was like, okay, this is going to be some medieval type of thing. Oh, kind of neat. So I'm thinking in my head, what if, you know, Clark, you know, what if Clark Kent, you know, arrived in uh, the medieval times, you know, instead of arriving, you know, when he did modern times. But it's not even that, really. It's, this is the whole, what if the whole universe occurred during the medieval times? Well, so I was like, oh, that is awesome. And it's not what if Clark Kent arrived in the middle, medieval times. What if the House of L arrived right. in the medieval times? Because Jorel, Lara, and Clark show up there. Jorel shows up, and Lara obviously too, with powers. Like the sun starts affecting him, and it changes the whole game. You know, when they show up, they're two adults that came from a different culture to this world with powers. There's a difference between being raised, to your point, as the Kansas farm boy. Because I don't think the, the, this Clark, well, super Kal-El in this, Kal-El is not being portrayed as this, like, bad guy. And I think they did a, re- Tom did a really nice job in this one of balancing out. You don't want to make Clark completely unlikable. You don't want to lose some of the strong, good qualities that come from... Because I, I don't think jor and Lara are bad people. I think they're good people. So they're raising their kid to be a good person. The problem is, because they're so different, they're being viewed, especially in medieval times, by others as a real potential threat. And it's known that they're different. They're foreign. They're not of the... you know Whether everybody knows that they're alien or not is irrelevant. It's that they're clearly some godlike entity in comparison, and they're feared because of it. And not in, not sometimes in a good way in the sense that there's respect in uh, from those that are close to them, but fear in another way from those outside. And the intermingling of families, and I love that it's not just one family versus the other. Um, the use of the Pierce family and their lineage... I thought was really, really great in this, but also the Amazons in this was really, really great in this. They start crafting this larger world that I really start caring about. This, absolutely, if there's a book that needs to be 12 issues, it is this. Uh, Because there's so much they're unfolding here so early on that I really love. And there's that twist with Bruce that is equally... I mean, Clark and Bruce aren't just... Comrades at arms, they're half brothers. Yep. Which is a unique twist. Well, yeah, giving giving Batman superpowers is a really cool thing in the way they're handling it, where mm-hmm. he's half Kryptonian, half human, and his, you know, Thomas and Martha Wayne actually raised him still, but he was raised as the steward, you know, as the uh you know the you know the the page steward whatever term at night to uh, the you know to Cal and it just you know it, it was kind of a really cool little twist on that and the one thing I do wonder with saying that the the House of L isn't bad guys and I agree they're not bad guys per se in that they want to conquer the world we got to remember they are grabbing people with powers solely because they have power. They haven't done anything criminal, but the House of L is taking them and holding them in prison cells just because they've got the powers and because they could potentially hurt, you know, um, the House of L. You know, especially the magic users are being killed because they are affected by magic. So right. it's there is a dance as to whether they are being good or bad. And I like that, the fact that they're not cut and dry good, not cut and dry yes. bad. There's there's still so much more to it. Yes. Yeah. It's it, Well, that's why even the way I said it, they're not evil people per se, I guess, is where I was really going with it. Um, but there's it's, a, it's, it's complicated, yeah. <laughs> as they say. Uh, I can understand some of their motivation. Doesn't mean I agree with all of them. But you you get what's going on here. It's an intriguing, intriguing world. That's something when 
I guess what I enjoy the most with stories like this is when you understand the world that you're reading about. You, you understand the rules of it and why there's motivations that are there. Uh, I love that because it's in Elseworlds, you can embrace characters that like I like the use of Harley Quinn in the court. Amanda Waller, General Waller, I think is <laughs> all <laughs> yeah. Alfred has a great role in this. Um there's so much to love in this particular story in the usage of characters. Hippolyta, Diana, it's not Kara, but you know, the the character that would be like the placeholder for Kara. Well, and it's, it, this is the daughter. This right, is right. Jarell's daughter. This is you know, so she's not the. But you know she, yeah, she, she's meant to be the Supergirl character as well. Oh I'm yeah, saying. yeah, meant I to mean, be the Supergirl character, and she's drawn the way Supergirl traditional look of Supergirl. So I'm like, hey, I thought that was really cool that they added too. on. You know, because you think about it, if Jarell and Lara were actually didn't die on Krypton, then they would be able to have more children. So they had another kid. They didn't just have uh, Cal. They had a daughter as well. And I, I thought that was kind of a neat way. Same thing like with uh, you know Jefferson, how he doesn't just have his two daughters. He had a son. And they introduced the son, and, well, we say goodbye to the son. You know? But that was kind of a neat little – that's the kind of stuff I like seeing in this story where they're taking things and they're tweaking them a little bit. Like the fact that Lois Lane is an Amazon. Yep. She would be, yeah, I could see someone strong will character, like you know, person like Lois Lane, not being in the House of L, but being in with the Amazons. That fits her character. That fits her personality. And but even then, though we have Olsen, Superman's best friend, is within the House of L. He is the kingdom of L because when he sees the asteroid, when he sees the kryptonite hit, he you know calls for fetch me a robin. You know, so he's in the, you know, the, the kingdom of L as opposed to the, uh, the kingdom of storms. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to see because Superman and Lois, I mean, Clark or Kal-El and Lois are eventually going to interact. I can't wait to see what that relationship looks like. Um, it's there's so much of this that they're gradually, you know, bringing out there. But Zala jor is an interesting person because the fears that Lex Luthor has come to life with her. Yes. What if they crack? What if, what if something sets one of them off? And you see what happens. Her dad dies. The power that she has, she's unstoppable. Uh, and it, it's an interesting sort of piece that you get to see where some of the most gifted warriors cannot touch her with a 10-foot pole. They go after her with an axe to the neck that would have taken that off of anybody else. Didn't in her case. She's still kicking. I mean, it's it was a really, really cool battle sequence. Where I love how they left you in that page at the end wondering, wait, we see the symbol come flying off, but wait, did she actually get hurt or what happened there? Nope. nope. <laughs> She's nope. still around and kicking. I loved, I loved the drama set aside from this. These pages, every single one of these pages is beautiful. Well, and as you said, she is just a great character because this is a grieving daughter who is just yep. flown off the hand. You know, we all know the pain that you feel when you lose somebody that close to you. Mm-hmm. When you, you know, just that anger, that pain. And you know, if you, you know, we have somebody who has these omnipotent like powers who has that suffered that great loss, and she is snapped. You know, and again, it's you know. I understand, you know, I can understand her pain. And, you know, this is one of those things where I always joke around about how I wouldn't want to have Superman's powers because of something like this. I would be worried. I would do something like this. I would snap. Now for me, I I could get cut off in traffic and I blast someone with the heat vision. You know, that's, I'm that short of a few sometimes, but with this, we're seeing, she's got this, you know, and again, and it's not even just an initial reaction. If she would have just simply snapped one thing when she killed the son, that could have actually calmed things down. She's continuing with the path of destruction. And I love when you know they get to that moment where no more kings, you know, and she kills them. I'm like, this is going beyond. She she's seriously gonna start a major, major if- issue. This is the prophecy coming to pass. This great prophecy they keep talking about how the House of El is going to destroy the world. 
this is the prophecy starting. It's on starting with her, not with Jarrell, not with Kal-El, but it's the daughter. I'm like, oh, that is awesome. What's going to happen to Diana and Zala when uh, Diana realizes Zala really did kill? Is Diana going to understand her? Is Diana going to try and bring her back to the light? Is there going to be the inevitable fight between the two? Of the, you know, is that going to be the case? Hippolyta, you know, siding with Jefferson because of the fact that they've had that rich history together, their kingdoms, and they've always stood together. And there is the loyalty between the two kingdoms. That's uh, when you talk about interesting politics. I love stuff like that. I think it's something that really stood out for me in this story that this world has a history to it predating this that we're finding out as readers as it's gradually unfolding it that relationship between diana and hippolyta is not drastically different than the relationship we see now between diana and hippolyta just the time frame's different the circumstances around it are adjusting it a bit but yet it is the still the still the same hippolyta still the same diana just in these circumstances. And I love the look of Diana, by the way. Oh, yes. did they nail that? Oh, big time, big time. And I'll tell you, it's, I think, I think we're going to get, you know, Diana versus, you know, it's going to be mm-hmm. when she realizes the truth, because right now she's saying, no, she would never do this. You know, she's going to seek out the truth. I think we're going to get, there's still enough of Diana in there that when she sees the truth, she's going to step up. And I think it, we're going to get an epic battle between those two. And I'm I'm worried about Diana in it, to be honest with you. But again, it's one of those things where now that they've introduced the kryptonite, maybe this is really going to change some stuff. And there's a lot going back. Again, when I start thinking off page, I start thinking of what could happen. Because they've changed the story. Bruce is now of the House of El. Yeah, he's you know a half-child, illegitimate, whatever you want to call him. But he is of that house. He could assume the control of that uh, kingdom. Sure. You know, the only thing standing in his way are two people who are highly affected by kryptonite. Maybe both of them will get go away and Bruce will take over. And it will be the House of Wayne. I don't know. Beyond things, those, are, those are all the different stories that run through my head. And the Diana and uh, the – I keep calling, wanting to call her Kara, <laughs> but it's La, you know, Zala – um, in Zala fight, I 100% think is coming, just like I think a Kal-El and a Zala fight is coming. You know, there's going to be, you know, a point, or actually a Kal-El versus Bruce fight. You know, it's, you know, there's 100% these things are running through my head. This is going to happen. No, this can happen. I think that's kind of the fun and excitement of this story is that there's so many different ways this story can go. We've got enough uh, time in a, you know, as you said, it's a 12 issue series. To, you know, we got enough to lay it out nicely for us. So I'm just sitting back and enjoying this stuff. Because again, like you, I want to see what's happening next. You know, and it's yeah. The beauty of the artwork in this, like I'm looking at the ship that we've got Jefferson flying in on. And, and I actually, we'd be remiss. I love that his sidekick is John Constantine. You know, his advisor yeah. is John Constantine. It makes sense in this world that John Constantine would be a natural advisor in this. And a young John Constantine. And Jefferson's older. He's more stately. I love the ship, you know, the, the, with the lightning sails and, you know, just everything that we'd love to see. But what gorgeous design. The design work in this, that's something I would love to see, the concept artwork behind the scenes. Like, as they were unfolding this, as they were, like, how long was this in production? And what did the original concept sketches look like for this? Because it is such a good looking book. Yeah. You know? well, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, like, Constantine, he's got that similar style to the current universe. Yeah. You know, he's, it's not, a, he's not wearing his tan trench coat, but he's got that tan cape that kind of like drapes, kind of like he was wearing his trench coat. Mm-hmm. We talked earlier about Diana, her layout, very similar to, you know, how we, she looks now. That actually, that costume could actually even get transpired into the current universe. I think that's the kind of stuff they did really well with this, you know, in the creation where these characters, it 100% fits you know, our universe. And I think that for me is something that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the piece that I really enjoyed with all this was seeing that as the story continues on and we get to see Batman in his armor, 
that was something that really stood out for me. I, I like his armor. And I like <laughs> I like that one of the things <laughs> he gets poked fun at a lot is the pointy ears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, there's something about that familiarity of it, like in that outfit, that in this environment, it's viewed a little differently. And that was something I really enjoyed seeing what that was like. The concluding sequence, and, and we can jump, jump back and talk about other things, where we got to see him and Alfred riding along and we saw what happened with Kryptonite and him. And Alfred knowing the story, which, of course, he would know the story, right? He's Alfred, of course. Yeah. I am so excited for next issue, knowing the secret history background. We're three issues into this story. We, we've gotten hints of it, from jor in particular. I, I want to know the whole story and how it was played out, but I'm glad it isn't until now. I yeah. needed all of this first because I think it adds something more to this, knowing that we're getting it right now in the story. Oh, big time. And I'll tell you, it's one of the interesting things, you know, because yeah, Alfred has that line, whoever or whatever landed here is gone. Yeah. And then they see the kryptonite. Now, it was funny. When I first read this, I took it as the kryptonite was the thing that landed. And it was a giant kryptonite at kryptonite asteroid and someone picked it up and took it part of me is wondering what if it's not another piece of krypton that landed but what if it's the house of zod what if zod also made it off of krypton and we're now introducing new kryptonians to this world i'm in in this book i trust yeah. Here's the beauty of it. That could be introduced in this series. It could be introduced into uh, what I hope will eventually be an inevitable sequel to this story. I, there's so much going on right now. I don't know that you need to introduce that, but you could. I, I mean, it's, yeah. And I don't say that as a dispute to anything you just said. It's more of, yes, I can see us going in a lot of different directions with this. I'm open to all of it and enjoying all of it. I mean, this is one of those stories where, I don't know, where Tom Taylor wants to take me on this ride. Go for it. Um, I'm. This was every. Everything I thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah. And again, I'm 100% in with you and Tom Taylor. I trust on this. Because initially, when I read this, I initially took it as a giant chunk of kryptonite landed. And somebody has that giant chunk of kryptonite yeah, somewhere. Yeah. And that's where it's going to play out later on. And this was just a little fragment that they missed, you know, buried in the snow. But again, I, I did think, what if it's something else? You know, and I, that's what I, you know, first thought that popped in my head is, what if we're going to get the House of Zod as well? And that'll be – because to me, in my mind, that could be the linchpin that unites all of the houses together. When you've got you know, not only – maybe the prophecy isn't you know, Zala. Maybe the prophecy is Zod. You know? And I was like, that, that was kind of, again, so many different things they could go with this. And I'm so excited for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's uh, – there's so many directions they can go. Like, here's the thing. I, did I think the Metal Men were going to be in this? Yeah. No. And and this version, uh, the way that they handled the Metal Men with the House of Magnus. I, I like, uh, what a great idea. I mean, you could have made that any random army there. But I love the fact that they're just kind of playing this out. It's it's really, really cool. You know, we're like, oh, we can pull from DC and, and really reimagine what the Metal Men are like in this particular world for as long as they're with us in this particular yeah. world. Uh, it's it's such an interesting story. Actually, it, I wonder if the House of Magnus's response leads to some form of magical robotic Metal Men out of this. Uh, it would be interesting to see. Or, or, if, that's, or if that's going to be it. Oh, definitely could be, you know, and also could be the House of Magnus is the ones who found the asteroid, maybe. Sure. You know, so Magnus now has a bunch of kryptonite and a reason to be angry at the House of El. Again, there's so many different things that you could do. And one of the things I absolutely loved in the fight sequence between Jefferson and Zala, you know, and I loved how he was sitting there and... He uses his boat as a channeling to magnify his energy. And that was something, again, that I missed initially. I just thought he was just shooting lightning bolts. And then you look closely and you see, no, he's grabbing those two handles on the the big pointy thing on the end of his boat. And that's actually where the energy is coming from. And even he says, I wasn't ready for you last time. I'm ready for you this time. And blasts her. And I thought that for me was another really cool, again, just – Furthering going on with what these people can do, what they, you know, they don't have the technology, 
right. that they have in the current days, but they have this version of what they can do. And he's using whatever that metal is to accentuate his power. So I thought that, again, that was a really neat little moment. The tiny details in this, I think, is what sets the world apart, right? It fleshes out the idea that this is not, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Yeah. And and I really enjoy that. Uh, it's you know Tom Taylor had a lot of experience with this with fleshing out the injustice world based on the video game, and now has taken a his own unique concept and and gone somewhere with it. And it just shows how you can you can tweak and play with these concepts, and they're so malleable to great ideas. Um, he's nailing this. I mean, it's just... Oh, big time. I, I had no doubt that he was going to, but what I love about this one, it's very similar to what we were saying about the uh, jock story uh, in in the last segment, is this was, su- I don't know, at least for me it was, such a surprise, the amount of things that he did with this that I did not see coming. I, I, in, I really enjoyed that. Oh, big time. And again, yeah, this is one of those where, yeah, I was like, I didn't know what was going on other than you see the cover art and you're like, oh, okay, medieval times. Oh, okay, Elseworld in medieval times. And that was the only thought I had going through my head. And then you start reading it. And again, you take what is there. It was the whole universe pulled into it. Then adding on to it, the fact that Jarrell and Lara were alive. I'm like, oh my God, this adds to it. Then we add Zala into the mix. Like, oh, nice. We got, they got a daughter. And yes, she's angry. Oh my God, she just rammed a pole through Jefferson. What the heck? It's little things like that where it was just like taking the story again, personalizing it, telling us this great story that we're getting from this. And again, it's, there's so many moments of just beautiful horror. You know, there is, you know, when, when she rams the pole through his body, you know, the, the coloring, just a look of what on his face, you know, as it's, you know, pass as a chunk of wood passes through his chest, you know, and even the look on her face, no more Kings, you know, you could kind of, I could hear the anger and the venom in her voice just from reading. This was one of those where, I love the story, but this art team is also just taking it to a whole nother level. You said it earlier that this was the perfect team for this book. 100% agree with you. And just some of the facial expressions, some of just the the shock and awe, the violence, the gore, the beauty of it, just the, the, the majesty of taking what we currently know and putting it to this time period. You know, Jimmy Olsen looking through the te- the telescope instead of looking through a uh, camera. You know, little things that the commonality. Lois Lane being this the advisor, being the instead of being the reporter, but she's still doing that investigation. She's still being the intel, still being the kind of spy. You know that she always was as this great journalist. She still has her same strengths. You know, Bruce and Alfred working together, fighting the bad guys, Bat, the Bat having his Robins, you know, the Robins, you know, and then the different personalities of the Robins. I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah, and uh, totally everything you're saying, this, that's that think that's one of the keys for this. Every page was, this is awesome. Um, yeah. The, from the fine details of the artwork, the dialogue, the story, um, this was just really well put together. This is a template for how you build a creative team towards a series where they craft a unique world. I would read this if you took the DC characters out of it. I would be intrigued with it. The fact that the DC characters are in it just adds a whole other layer of coolness to it. But, I mean, it's a great story in and of itself without it being the DC characters. If I'm making any sense in what I'm saying there, I'm trying to complement the quality of the story. Because I think when you've got a great story, then you put in these amazing characters and the variations on them that he puts in here, it, it kicks it to 11. You know, and, and the fact that it is the DC characters, that he's got free reign to do what he wants with them, just makes it... I want to eventually... I say this all the time, but this would be a great animated miniseries like an HBO Max miniseries, if that makes any sense. I'm hoping we start to get some more of these experiments on HBO Max. I would be glad to see this as one of the direct-to-animation releases that they do, but almost because of the scope and scale of it, I'd love to see it be a miniseries more, like what they're doing with Peacemaker, but doing it animated. Yep. If I'm making any sense. 
Um, just because I think, you know, you've got that great Young Justice animation that's going on there right now. I mean, that actually, that'd be the animation. If you can get that animation team to do this, <laughs> it would be uh, so fantastic. I would love to see this as a miniseries. Uh, just because I think this is ready-made for HBO Max. They're looking for content. Um, it's This is it. This is the kind of thing you want to see. Marvel did it so recently with What If on Disney+. Plus, and it was outstanding because the artwork was stellar um they did this star wars visions series too that was animated where it was different animators were telling these these like 20 minute 15 to 20 minute stories um in in their own style uh and i I see something like this being like tailor-made to expand the hbo max lineup for us to see more of this i I want this this is what i want to see this come to life so a Tom Taylor story is tailor made for this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, yeah. I that really agree. was no pun intended. But uh, yeah, I'd lo- I'd love to see this come. I I would love to see this animated. We are Crystal Man from Mercury. We have no quarrel with you. How you doing, Sean and Jim? This is Ross Food. Just wanted to commend you guys on excellent work you guys are doing, and let's talk about the DC apps and apps in general again. The way I use my apps are I read three books a day from each app. I read Comicsology on the weekend when I'm at work, and I choose magical characters, teen books, golden age. I have a golden age day, a Batman day or Batman with his family. I have a Superman and a Legion day. I have a wild storm day, just where I read wild storm. And I just mix it up, and then... When those books are done, I just go to a, the next thing. I'll just like, I'm trying to read all Justice League books that have ever been. And I'm close to finishing it. And I find the apps of great value. I don't know how anyone can. It's just an amazing thing. And it's fun. And I've just got an iPad and it makes reading the apps just much more enjoyable than reading them on the telephone. So you guys keep on raising and I'll see you guys. Listen to you guys in the future, and you guys have a pleasant day. He makes an interesting point about what value when he when he talks about value of the apps. Like he's got his apps organized, and he's talking about the DC app and other apps that he's he's utilizing with comics, and how he's making themed days, Golden Age, uh, Batman days, Legion days, things like that. You know, themed days, and I like that idea a great deal. I think it's what I've tried to do with the apps now is. Figure out ways that I'm enjoying, which is what he's doing. Figuring out ways that I'm enjoying reading the apps where I'm not forcing myself to use the apps. I'm using the apps in a way that's really enjoyable for me. It is older material that I'm going to that I'm interested in uh, a lot of times. And the originals, like stuff that you can only get on the app are things that I grab uh, and, and find myself gravitating towards. Um, in particular, when I'm talking about the DC app. Uh, a lot of the older material... Is it's great to be able to jump in where I was reading before. Milestone I referenced last time. I'm reading a lot of Milestone right now on the app and really enjoying it. But I love that, to his point, you can craft yourself theme days based on your preferences and really enjoy and delve into multiple issues of a particular theme and make progress. Um, I, I like the idea of story progress. We talk about it here, like Dark Knights of Steel that we just talked about. It was fun reading three issues of that and feeling a progression of the story as we're going through. So I'm finding with the apps, I'm enjoying the most reading two or three issues of the same title when I sit down and feeling like I'm going forward, I'm progressing in the story. I forgot like the books like DC Comics Presents and things like that did have an ongoing story a lot of times. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just like these random single issue teams, but sometimes there were done in ones, but there was usually an arcing story that connected at least a few of the stories together. And sometimes one team up led to another team up based on the cliffhanger from the previous story, which I didn't remember that because it had been so many years since I'd really sat down and read those books. Uh, And sometimes, clearly, I was reading broken lots of those books. I didn't realize how much there really was an ongoing continuity for obvious reasons to get people to keep reading the book, to keep following along the ongoing story besides just the team up, which is a nice different layer to them. Um, obviously, I'm reading DC Comics Presents and Brave and the Bold <laughs> on the app uh, just from those comments. But 
That's it. Do you you mentioned a lot of times that you'll start out your day reading a couple of comics, or you know you have like certain you have a certain schedule that it's comic reading seems to fit into for you. Um, do you when you do that? Is there a theme to it? Are you reading multiple issues of the same title, or are you just jumping to books that like you know? Hey, these are three books that I really want to get. There's no right or wrong to that. I'm just curious to what does that look like for you? Well, actually, it's funny because. I, I really had no plan on it. I just go, ah, I'll go with this one. Ah, you know, completely disorganized kind of cluster. And hearing the idea of like this day is this, this day is that, I'm like, man, that's a neat idea. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start designating that Monday is Superman Day. Tuesday, they, you know, they're laying out what I'm going to read, you know, and that will actually help guide which, you know, where I'm using. Because I've got Comixology and then I've got the DC app. DC app I usually use more for older stuff. Mm -hmm. Going back and I'm trying to read. My goal is to read every single issue of Action Comics. That's my personal goal that I have set for myself. Sweet. And I'm not going to own every single issue. I'm going to read every single issue. And it's not even just, you know, if there's all the collected editions out there. I'm like, no, I actually want to read an individual issue. Because what I do is before going to work, I read an issue. You know, usually just one, sometimes two, depending on you know how I'm feeling. And then at the end of work, I read another uh, comic comic book, and it's either again one or two, depending on what kind of day I had. If I had a more stressful day, I'll read two issues. You know, if I had a nice, easy, light day, it'll just be one. You know, because it's kind of that whole I need to get just you know zen, you know, kind of get my calm on. You know, after a day of work, sometimes and sometimes it's a three comic day. I don't know. <laughs> I've had a couple of those. But this notion of actually organizing which title, what you know, genre or thing, that's a neat idea. I hadn't thought of that. You know? So I'm like, that's kind of cool. I'm, I'm digging that idea. You know, it's, right now, I think the only organized I had was usually Friday is non-DC day. The last couple of Fridays, I've always read something outside of DC, mm -hmm. you know, and it's again, some of it is Comixology makes a recommendation because you bought this, you may like this. I'm like, yeah, let me try that. Others, uh, Ross Wills gave some great suggestions that I've been reading and loving those. So I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll you know read those kind of things. And no, oh, another Blue Flame came out. Let me read that, you know. And so there's a couple of different stuff like that. So it, that's really the only organization I've ever had. So now I think I'm start laying out looking and doing an official kind of thing. So I don't know. I, yeah, I'm starting to get a little bit more organized on my reading. That's something I find because time is limited on what I have free time to do. I've got to be more organized and I've got to use it more judiciously. Yeah. I, it's funny. You mentioned some of his recommendations like blue flame and I encourage Russell and, and everybody else listening to this podcast, don't hesitate to shout out books, whether you're doing it on our podcast here, you're doing it in our Facebook group, that you're reading, whether it's DC or not DC. I think we all benefit from hearing what people are enjoying. Um, I find myself looking a lot more from people. It's like we don't all have to like the same things. We may shout out books here on the show that you'll, you may enjoy listening to why we like a book. But also are like, guys, that wasn't my cup of tea at all. That's okay. That's sometimes part of the discussion process is you know wrapping your heads around the why. I really benefit when a listener shouts out a book that they're enjoying, particularly when it's something that I'm not reading. And why? Why do you like that? Because that's helpful for me to know really quickly if it's a book for me. I get the same thing, actually, when somebody doesn't like a book. There's been times where somebody hasn't liked a book or a movie. Movies happen to be more than anything else. Where, because of the fact that their reasoning is not just that crabby sort of, well, it's stunk because I don't like this person or that type of thing. Yeah. If there's a real depth-filled reason as far as why somebody doesn't like something, a lot of times that's drawn me to it, the project. Because what they don't like about it is actually something I look for in stories. So I think you can have really strong commentary when there's something you don't like. Um, and that can draw people to it, too. It, it just depends on you know, how, how intelligent is the discussion around it, um, which happens you know, quite a bit. So I don't know. This is, this is really great. I, I'm with you. The theme days are a great idea. We do have another voicemail from Russell that I'm going to put on right now. And just... 
before that voicemail goes on, he his phone broke up a little bit, and he's talking about the new Wonder Woman Black Label series when it cracks up. But then later on, you'll you'll get his you'll get his feelings on that particular book, and then he delves into a couple other topics that are really interesting that we'll respond to afterwards. But I just wanted to put that preface on there beforehand that there's an area where it breaks up a little bit, and he's talking about that new Wonder Woman hardcover. Or Wonder Woman, I should say, the new Wonder Woman Black Label series. How you doing, Sean? And Jim, happy new year to you both. I want to say I want to continue on an excellent job that you're doing on this podcast. I like the way you do these comic books and blocks now. Like you cover all of the Wonder Woman and Green Lantern books. I really enjoy that format because it actually helps me stay abreast of what I need to do. But let's talk about the state of doing some comics. I keep seeing that DC theory. I disagree. Comics is really delivering comics. That's a great black label, which is hundreds of Wonder Woman books. I've never seen anything like this. Just for the art alone, the book is worth buying and putting. I threw it in a pile and had to pay for it. This is a book that everyone, comic book fans and non-comic book fans alike, need to be reading. Being DC getting you a, a curveball with a book like one Star Squadron with the, re- with the Return of Power Girl, who is my probably my favorite DC superhero in the whole universe. Love to see her. Wish she was in the mainstream book, but I'll take Power Girl however I can get her. Next thing up, I would like to say, the TV shows are not declining. They're just replacing them. We got Naomi coming on next week. You know, Flash will probably eventually be in, but we got Star Girl. And someone needs to do something with the Shade character in a solo miniseries. This guy who acts the part of the Shade is an amazing actor. He needs, a, like, a miniseries on the CW or HBO Max or something. He needs to be utilized. And the last thing I'll talk about is books that we all need to be getting from other companies. If you are into Image, they got a book out called Echo Lands. And the fascination with this book is, the fascination with this book from Echo, from an image called Echo Last of that. You don't read the book side to side. You put, you pick the book up from top to bottom. So it's really fascinating. It's on slick paper. So it's very enjoyable. And I like to tell you gentlemen about an older book you can get off comics out It's a book called Black. And the book is about a world where every African American in the world has superpowers. Something for you guys to check out is really different. It's never seen nothing like this before. And those the two books that I would like for you guys to go check out. And if anybody else is out there listening, you can go check out these two books. And you guys keep on raging, keep making a great podcast like you always do. And I'll see you next time. You have a great day. He covers a lot of cool things there. Uh, in particular, talking about the fact that uh, there's kind of that thing about is DC delivering or not right now. And, boy, yeah, I, I'm not having any problem with the quality of the product that's going out right now. I think, like we've mentioned in the past, I always look for when creators are no longer with the company or no longer have exclusives, what are they doing next? And that's where shout-outs like he's giving with Echo Lands and Black and things like that are really important because it points people to other work. Um, the experimentation, I haven't read Echo Lands yet. I'm looking at it actually right now, and I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. going to read that one. And I haven't read Black yet either, but I've I've heard good things about Black. That one I'd heard about before. Echo Lands I have not heard of. Black I have. And, uh, I mean, the creative teams on Echo Lands, it's kind of like, yeah, it's for me. But when he was talking about just the different format, that to me is when comics are at their best, when there's that experimentation, right, of let's take how you normally approach a comic and let's turn it on its head a little bit. Let's play around with it and tell the story in in a different format in a different format, a different way of looking at the page, I guess is more of uh, what he was talking about there. That kind of stuff is really, really cool to me. And, and those are those are recommendations that I value when you get a chance to see something different. It's something that comics can do that no other form can do in the same way. And it's it's when people really get to embrace the medium and get to know more about the medium, it's why I'm so protective of it. I think it's why us, everybody listening to this is very protective of it. You want it still around. Um, whether we all agree on the quality of what's going on at DC right now or across comics in general, okay, that's subjective. We all have our own opinions and things like that. I think comics are at an all, continue to be at an all-time high. Uh, but 
you know, that's that's going to be a subjective piece. But we want this form to continue, and we're all protective of it because of the fact that it continues to amaze us. And that part is really interesting. Have you read One Star, Star Squadron yet? No, I've been stockpiling it. And as soon so, as he mentioned it, I'm like, oh, i got to read that. Well, we're going to... So I got both issues. I'm, I'm putting that on the slate as one of the books coming up we're going to talk about because I oh, have, yeah. I have and I really do want to talk about this one. So I'm not going to say a whole lot about it right now other than I, I was like, oh, yeah, he's right. we got to talk about that. I mean, that one's pretty cool. Um, so we'll, we'll throw that on the slate as an, an upcoming episode. We'll talk about that miniseries as it unfolds. Uh, he was also talking about that um, the history of Themyscira book that's out there and the art quality of it. And that's a book that if it is not being picked up by, like, that needs a coffee table book when it's done. Uh, you know, like whether an absolute or, you know, a deluxe edition, some form, a uh, deluxe edition isn't the right thing. Some form of, a, a coffee table book is the right thing. It'd be nice if it could have some anecdotes and things like that in it as well, just behind the scenes. Just because I see that being something I would love to have on my table as a page turner for people that come over and visit. Because it's a beautiful book, unique story, uh, and a unique presentation that people would page through. And I I had coffee table books on my table over the holidays, and people were paging through them. I mentioned a, a Disney 50th anniversary one that I had on there. I have comic book related ones that I put out on the table, too, for that reason. And people page through them. It's, I am, of course, the typical comic fan that I have my copy for the table and my copy <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, it's, I had, actually, that Disney 50th anniversary, because I'm a huge Disney fan, I strangely have two copies of that. I have one, because I'm not... Com- my wife said, we should put that on the coffee table. I said, you mean like for other people to like pay through <laughs> She's like, honey, it's called a coffee table book for a reason. I said, yeah, but do you understand the kind of person I am when it comes to book and books and collectibles? <laughs> I said, I get your point. I said, here's the problem. I said, honey, you're making sense. I'm not. But, like, you know I'm going to get a second one of this now because of this, right? <laughs> Dude, oh my god, yes. <laughs> and everyone listening to you is saying, yes, we completely agree with you, Sean. You are right. Whereas anybody who's not one of us were like, uh, dude, it's just a book. Yeah. What are you talking about? Well, well, other friends of mine came over and they're like, you have two of these? They said, yeah. I'm like, you want me to buy your other one off you? No. <laughs> That's my That's copy. My other one. That is different. my copy. This is the reader. This yes. is the story. Come this on. This is the one with Let's... your fingerprints on it. The, uh, my other Perfect one, sense. your fingerprints Perfect will sense. never no. be on. Yes. Well, there's a, yeah. of course, there's a logic to it. There's not an OCD component to no. it at all. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> he mentions the Naomi TV series coming, and I'm really excited for that series to be coming out. And I'm going to echo what he said. I'm a, as people know, if you've listened to this show for a long time, huge fan of Starman, the James Robinson run. His two shade miniseries were out of this world. I love what's going on with the shade on Stargirl. Yeah, go for it. Please, like, listen to him. Make that series. I will watch it over and over again. And... I do think that's something that he mentions as like an HBO Max thing. I agree with him. I think that's a great vehicle for that. Uh, Because I do think people would really enjoy it on that platform. And I I think my reference earlier about um, the the Tom Taylor story and doing it on HBO Max. I'm a big fan of Disney Plus. And Disney Plus is delivering like What If and, and a lot of unique content like that. The Hawkeye series. I mean, you're seeing a lot of stuff that's coming out in in the various Marvel series that have come out over there. There's various terrific Star Wars series coming out over there. They've got these wonderful DC properties. Yes, more of that should be appearing on HBO Max. It rounds out that catalog that they have there. It's an interesting time right now because I'm, I'm watching... My wife and I have gotten into Yellowstone recently. I mean, we're jumping on it late. And um, 1883, which is on Peacock and Paramount Plus, respectively, but they're in the same universe. You know, those apps have just a wealth of diverse content on them. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of room for stuff to be fleshed out on uh, HBO Max for it to compete with what's going on over at Disney Plus. 
it's an interesting time for television and entertainment and film and, and everything right now as far as delivery methods, how how you respond to we've got we've still got a pandemic going on and, and how you create and get content to people and what that's going to look like. Um, we are in a, I don't want to say transition period, that seems to be not the right label for it, um, an evolution sort of, of, of media and content. And uh, I'm very protective of certain things in that evolution that I don't want to lose, uh, but it's an interesting sort of time. Um, to see, I like the new things that are coming out. So I like the new delivery methods. I like these streaming services. I like things that we're seeing. I'm watching Cobra Kai right now on Netflix. It's back again, and that's a show. Have you de- have you delved into that show at all? Oh yeah, yeah I have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we just started watching season four. No spoilers, but I'm like, well, this is great. <laughs> More, yeah. I'm glad this is Dude, back. I am so happy that show is around because that that is. Again, I, I like the the new movie. Yeah, I thought it was a good one. Mm-hmm. But again, nothing nothing compares to the original. Nothing compares to the fact that the ev- evolution of the series and just um yeah, I'm so happy that it's yeah that it's back. So, have you seen the new Ghostbusters movie? No, I haven't, but I want to. So, like they did the reboot, which I like. Yeah. I, I'm I'm a fan of the reboot, but it was it was that it was a reboot. This is more Cobra Kai than Reboot. Yeah. In the sense that um, the new movie is very much a homage to what came before, but new and fresh and today. Um, It feels, the best way to say it, it's a modern day 80s adventure. And it embraces all of those tropes, but it's modern. It feels very today and very current, yet it has the right amount of what we loved in those old 80s kind of adventure movies that were coming out at that time, just like Cobra Kai does it, where it's not it's not going out of its way to be the original Karate Kid movies, but yet has the right elements in it for the people that enjoyed those. It's, it's interesting. I, where this is tying back into all of this, I think there's some really cool opportunities as out of this Spider-Man movie that just came out, there's rumors of there being some form of Tobey Maguire revival of some sort, whether it's animated or live action or not. I don't, you know, if if it's going to come to fruition, that'd be a thing. But there's been a renewed interest in both that and the Andrew Garfield universe. The Tobey Maguire one I've heard has got a lot more legs to it right now. We'll see where that goes. What I love about that is hopefully we see some DC properties being explored that way. Um, we're seeing more being done. Like I've heard that um, in the Batgirl film, Michael Keaton's going to be reprising his role as Batman. That has yeah. me interested. That has me excited. I-, I like the idea that DC is kind of getting away from this idea that we can only have one Batman. We can only have one Superman. Maybe not. Like how about embracing all of those? Uh, And I I think what it'll do is this will get past that I can't like this actor's portrayal of the character. Well, it's an interpretation. That's okay. Because you've got over here this animated version that is revitalizing the one that you really liked. And, I mean, that's just as valid. I think it's really important that they, instead of looking down one lane, they embrace the multiverse and the different the different years, the different delivery methods of these characters. Um, because I think that's that's why the Spider-Man movies had such buzz. And I think it's going to have a positive impact for us as viewers um, and consumers of this content that I think we're going to see DC continuing the path that they're going down where they're exploring and they've been doing it lately. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more embracing of the idea of, well, we don't have to ignore stuff that came before. We can revitalize <laughs> and bring some of it back, and people are looking for that. And, and, I, and I want in there new interpretations like the Batman movie that's coming up. I, th- I think the balance of all of that together is really terrific. So I'm glad, glad we're seeing more of this um, coming out. I think streaming services are having a positive impact with that because of the fact that it's so much easier to access the old stuff as well as the new. This is cool. But thank you, Russell, as always, for uh, giving us some great recommendations. I I always like learning about new comics because it is hard to sift through 
just how much content is out there. So I encourage um, that first of all, I encourage you to keep calling in, and anybody out there, please keep sh- sharing the love for things that you're really digging, both in in and out of DC, because I think it's really important that uh, people notice these works. Hey, let me throw something else out there real quick, because sure. you know, just based on the recommendation, I was looking at this uh, the book Black, and it's under Black Masks. Black Mask Studios. And I just started looking through Blast, the, the different titles available, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of cool-looking stuff in this uh, within this company. So these are the kind of stuff that I love when I get a, when I get a recommendation, I'm like, ah, that sounds kind of neat. I always dive into what else, what other stuff does that company do? So there's a couple titles within uh, this studio that I'm going to be uh, looking at now. So thank you. Jamal Leigel's on her on that, too, by the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, really cool stuff, which I don't know I don't know how I missed that. Definitely jumping on that. Holy caffeine. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show. Raging Bill Raging Billets. Raging Bullets at gmail.com is our email address. If you prefer to contact us that way, it's an easy way to get a hold of us. RagingBullets.com is our show website. It feeds Twitter. It feeds our Facebook fan page. The About Us section of our show website will tell you how to contact us on gaming platforms, social media. We are also proud to be part of an amazing Facebook group community. And I pop in there throughout the week just to check and see what people are talking about. People will post articles of interest and things like that. Um, Shout out podcasts, shout out books, shout out whatever. And it's always a safe fun conversation area. Jeremy and the whole crew over there do a really great job of just curating content and doing it in a way that's fun and exciting. So thank you to everyone that's over there for continuing to keep that going. It's really their group, and we're proud to be associated with it. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? We have Batman Beyond, The White Knight, Issue 1, 50% off, two forty nine. dollars We've got the Batman Black and White box set, 50% off, fifty two fifty. We have Batman Fear State Saga hardcover, 50% off, twenty four ninety nine. And we have Batman Killing Time, Issue 1 of 6, 50% off, only two forty nine. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, I want to remind everybody once again, be sure to be bookmarking that and checking out the deals of the week. You can get amazing discounts on the deals of the week. Wonder Woman Book 2, Aries Rising Trade Paperback, $29.99 regularly, 60% off, only $11.99. Young Justice Volume 3, Warriors and Warlords Trade Paperback, $19.99 regularly, 60% off, only $7.99. Super Suns Trade Paperback Book 1, Polar Shield Project, $9.99 regularly, 65% off, only $3.04. 49 cents. Robin, the Bronze Age Omnibus Hardcover. This is a $125 book that's 65% off, only $43.75. Brand new. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Our next episode, Jim and I are going to be back and exploring around the DC Universe. We haven't had a chance to talk about Detective Comics in a while, so we're going to check in on the brand new Detective Comics story that's going on. We're also going to check in with The Flash and see what's going on in his world. We will see you next week. Bye. All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I'm sure we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim! Okay, fellas, get ready.
That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim! Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, 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 that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't. I didn't what mean to buy that. I think it's going to be my song. 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 I think it